<laughs> one more time. One more time. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Matt Lauder. I'm doing front of house for Tim Hicks today at Hagersville Rocks. Tell us how you got started, because obviously you didn't just wake up one day and was like, hey, I want to be a touring sound guy. No, it was kind of by happenstance. Uh, I started as a, as a guitar tech for a pop band about eight years ago. And uh, I always had a passion for audio, but I didn't have a vessel. And uh, the singer noticed that, and he kind of gave me a chance. And he, uh, he let me mix in some clubs and kind of step up. And I screwed that up for a long time. And then uh, eventually just slowly started getting better and better. And uh, next thing you know, I got hired by another band to mix them. And it was just small clubs and um, you know, really, really awful touring conditions. But I uh, stuck it out, and uh, I made it here. Wow, so okay. far, so yeah. So now, great. did you just work for other bands? Did you work for other companies while gaining your experience as your? Yeah, the first thing and the best thing that I did in my career was start at a production company. Right out of high school, I joined uh, a co-op placement, so like an, an internship essentially, and uh, they taught me all the basics um, fast, and, and it was real life. Uh, and then from there, I went to school for a year, and then I dropped out of school to go on tour for a band. And then I've been pretty much freelancing for bands and other production companies ever since. So it's, it's been a healthy mix of touring and also production work. And I think that's really good because you get a technical knowledge of how the gear works. And then you go out on the road or you start mixing bands. And that's more of the artistic approach. So it's, I, it's good to know both for sure. So then do you pick up new gigs, as we call it, or, or new hookups with other bands from band referrals or from the production company you're working for? They're sending out gear with the band and they say, hey, we need a sound guy. How does that, how does that all work out? Getting work with bands for me so far has been mostly just word of mouth. You know, I'll work for one band and they'll refer me to another management company or whatever. Um, and yeah, so that that's kind of how my touring career has developed, it's just knowing people. And you know, also being good at what you do, being a hard worker, being personable, and uh, from that it helps me get production work as well. It kind of builds okay. a reputation, and but it, they they both help each other out. Okay. So, so who are you with today? Like, um, obviously you're with the band. How did you get ended up uh, hooking up with this band? Uh, currently, I'm mixing today. Tim Hicks. Um, it was an, uh, like I said, it was a word of mouth thing. Uh, he has the same tour manager as another band I work for, and we work well together. So. Yeah, I uh, just started with him. I, we, I've been with Tim Hicks about a year now, and it's been going pretty pretty well. Now, Tim Hicks is country. Um, have you always been in the country world mixing? How do you approach this style of music versus other styles of music? Tim Hicks is my first country gig, and I love it. It's amazing. Uh, I, I kind of always you know, poo-pooed country and made fun of it until I actually started working for a band uh, uh, for country musicians. Uh, I've found the players are just way tighter and it's more of a, a family vibe. You know, it's, it's actually, in my mind, it's easier to mix because everybody just knows what they're doing, you know, and everybody can play really well together. And if the band is really tight and the band can play really well, it makes it really easy to translate that to this. Mm. You know, you're not trying to polish any turds, you know. <laughs> But we're in a festival situation today, yeah. um, so you're not touring with the transport of gear, of your own gear. What do you like to advance? Do, are you stuck on certain consoles? Do you just make what is their work? Are there things that you have to have? Yeah, definitely uh, one thing I've learned is you want to be familiar on a range of consoles, but you, you want to make sure that um, you look at how much time you have in soundcheck versus uh, what console you have because you're only given you know maybe tops as a headliner three hours to set up and an hour to sound check and after that you're done for the day until showtime so you really have to squeeze in everything from patch to your mix to uh, anything else you're doing in years and if you're production managing or tour managing uh, next thing you know that four hours gets really narrow really small so you have to do whatever you can to be as efficient as possible uh, and for me, that is having a really solid festival console file on multiple consoles helps. But uh, my go-to festival file is the Avid Profile or SC48. Uh, but today, I, I chose to go with my favorite touring desk, which is the Midas Pro 2, just to kind of switch it up. I like to challenge myself. But again, I also have a file built. So 
uh, I can rest easy knowing that I only get a couple songs in soundcheck, but I know it's going to translate well to the show. So you're so. saying uh, on a digital board, it's probably a lot harder to go from a digital board that's a blank slate than, say, walking in in the old days to a big 48 analog board blank slate. Yeah, definitely. Uh, back in the analog days, it was really easy. You could just, you know, fire through the inputs and all the knobs are right there. But uh, especially with different consoles, they think differently and act differently. And those couple seconds that you take to think something out and switch a page, those all add up. Mm. So yeah, it's digital. There's certain digital desks that are better for throw and goes. Uh, this one is not. So it's it's actually very good to to have. Uh, an, an, an example: the last tour we went on, uh, we had two production rehearsal days, two days of rehearsal, mm -hmm. where I could just sit behind the desk and they were doing their thing and I had the time to slowly build a mix. And that meant that when we went into the first day of the tour, we were ready to go. Mm -hmm. And the brunt of it was done. And that's okay. really important. And I would say if, you, if you're if you ever bringing out a desk out on the road, it's you pretty much have to tell your artist, like, I need some time on this because mm -hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn you. So you say this is your favorite uh, touring desk. What yes. is it about the Midas platform that you like? The thing I love most, number one about Midas Digital, is the preamps. Uh, it's my rule has always been start at the source. Uh, so if you have good mics going into good preamps, you're already in a really good spot. And from my experience, uh, I haven't mixed on everything, but from my experience, the Midas Digital is the best, most true transparent sounding board. And then on top of that, their compression and EQ is just next level. So uh, I find you just make little teeny tweaks and the work's done for you. So mm. sonically, it's, it's, it's just wonderful. Was it hard to learn and pick up the Midas, say, versus when you were learning the Avid platform? Yeah, there's definitely definitely a learning curve with the Midas Digital, but with any digital board, as long as you have the basics, uh, you know, like gain, EQ, uh, and even some analog analog experience, um, really helps because every board is different, but the basics are all there. Mm -hmm. So as long as you know the basics, with time you can learn any board. Okay. But there definitely is a learning curve. Yeah, it's it thinks a little differently than, than Avid. Okay. Now I understand you're not only doing the front of house mix for Tim Hicks, but you're also having to take care of their monitors. Let's talk about that a little. How are you doing both jobs at the same time? So what, 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 you, what you would traditionally do if your band doesn't want to hire a monitor guy or they want something consistent, there's two options. You can do monitors from front of house, which uh, is very annoying because I'm 100 feet away from the stage and you're sharing EQ settings and preamps. So what we did with Tim Hicks is uh, within the country scene, we've noticed a lot more of uh, the Behringer X32 rack. It's, it's, a, it's a full monitor rig in two little racks. So we have our own console and we have our own uh, in-ears. The whole band is on in-ears. And they actually control it through their phones and on an iPad. And out front I have a laptop that connects wirelessly to the X32 rack. So uh, in theory I can mix monitors and front of house with two completely separate splits. Okay. So you can make adjustments at front of house through your laptop if they do need to do something? Yeah, your lap my laptop or my phone or my iPad. I rarely don't need to because the band, once they get started and once they get rolling, unless there's an emergency, they'll, they'll be able to, to muscle through it. Now, was that a hard sell to the band to go in-ears without having a physical person behind a console? Uh, they were, we were all a little reluctant at first because it was all so new to us, but once we realized that, you know, once everything was patched and ready to go, uh, it was actually pretty easy. And we actually have a system now where um, we load in and we patch, and I do the line check on the, on the, app, on the iPad. And then I, I'm actually on stage with the guys for the first song, and then I'll adjust their ears. Okay. And usually by the end of the first song, I'm already in front of house dialing in the, wow. the front of house. Mix. So it, it, it's a good system. It, w it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. You kind of have to pick and, uh, who, who your band is or just like make a system that right. works. But for now, that's working. So what we're saying is monitor guys are losing gigs. Uh, for now, <laughs> I, I think I think the X32 is actually great because bands that can't afford a monitor guy yeah. but can afford an X32 get to have awesome monitors. But eventually, you, you reach the point where you know the rack is not Limited. yeah, degree, where yeah. they're going to want an actual person. Behind it's a great them. stepping stone to it's, getting yeah, to that next level. Right? Great stepping stone. Do you get paid twice as much because you're doing front of house and monitors? Uh, that's what they told me. I still yeah. haven't got the check yet. Okay, so. fair enough. 
<laughs> um, well, that's, that's great. Do you have any, is, if there's one thing looking back, is there any regrets that you've had or has it all been, you know, should have gone into positive so far? I should have gone into the lighting. I'm sure. just, no, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> regrets? Um, or any opportunities that you look back on, hmm, maybe I should have done that. I, I've just recently started getting the multi-tracking yeah. and playing with audio outside of the box and actually mixing in Pro Tools or Logic uh, just to play. And I found it's really helped out um, understand like compression and gating and EQ. And even with the band, hearing the exact same in instruments uh, in a comfortable environment with my in-ears in, and I can really play and tweak and, and even mess with like routing and parallel compression and stuff, stuff that I wouldn't normally have time to do. Uh, it's fantastic because it's such a good learning curve, or it's, it's such a good tool to learn. And I, I wish I had started that five years ago because I'd be so much more ahead now. So I would say the best piece of advice for people getting into it now, for sound guys now, is you have all this technology that's becoming more and more accessible, multi-track recording, um, Pro Tools, uh, all kinds of things. Play with them. They're at your disposal. Sit there and, and use them. Um, because if, you, if you're not going to do it, somebody else will. And they're going to they're end up getting the job. Awesome. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think in closing, is there any final little bit of advice you could give to volunteers, people wanting to try and do what you do, get into the industry as we call it, uh, whether it be, you know, learn stuff or have a good attitude, is there any combination? What, what's your best advice you could give? I would say the best thing you can do is just work as hard as you possibly can and keep passionate and just don't be a d just <laughs> Just be a good person. Be personable, make people like you, and care about what you do, and and just work as hard as you can. Because when it gets, when you're up to bat with somebody else who maybe has a little more experience, but you're a harder worker, I've found odds are they're gonna favor the guy who, who busts. You know? That's that's fair enough. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to meet with us and sure talk thing. with us, and have cool. a good show tonight. Thank you.